The Byte Show is listener supported at thebyteshow.com. Let's get started. What are the farm hall transcripts? Oh boy. Uh, those are, those are something I talked about beginning way back with the first book in the Nazi series of books, a book called Reich of the Black Sun. Yeah. And the subtitle of that was called The Post-War Allied, the Post-War Allied Legend and Nazi Secret Weapons or something like that. I don't even remember the titles to my own books. But, uh, I first mentioned them there and I mentioned them again in the book called The Philosopher's Stone, which is what we're talking about. Yes. They are the secret recordings that the British made of some of the captured Nazi nuclear scientists. There were ten scientists that were taken to Great Britain after the end of the war. They were interred in a place called Farm Hall in a big uh, British manor house. Mm -hmm. And their conversations were recorded secretly by the British. They were not declassified until very, very late, uh, I think, right off the top of my head it was sometime in the mid 80s to early 90s somewhere in that time frame and they were translated and edited by a fellow by the name of Jeremy Bernstein in a book called Hitler's Uranium Club all right yeah and if you read them they make some for some very very revealing reading because for one thing in them it is clearly revealed by one Nazi scientist that they did have an accurate measure of the amount of critical mass of uranium-235 that would be required for an atomic bomb. The, the estimation of this one scientist was within the same estimations of allied uh, estimations for the time period. So in other words, we are not, once again, dealing with an incompetent nuclear program. It has been argued by some authors that Heisenberg, who of course was the most famous of those physicists that were taken there, that Heisenberg dramatically and drastically overestimated the amount of critical mass that was needed by orders of magnitude. And that for that reason, some authors argue that he either deliberately sabotaged the Nazi project or others argue that, no, the man was just incompetent <laughs> when, it, when it came to nuclear engineering, which which is patently untrue, because if you read my books carefully, uh, SS Brotherhood of the Bell in particular talks about the fact that Heisenberg had constructed a nuclear reactor in Leipzig in 1942 for the express purpose of what was called tickling the dragon's tail. In other words, taking a certain amount of uranium and bringing it close enough together that it would start spitting out neutrons so that they could get an accurate read of thermal neutrons that would be needed to explode an atomic bomb. So in other words, it was very, very dangerous work. Well, Heisenberg, in the process of testing this concept in 1942, let it be noted, yeah. had his reactor catch fire in Leipzig, and it, you know, it, it was kind of the first sort of uh, Chernobyl incident, <laughs> quite frankly, because the reactor burned and burned and burned, of course, and the Nazis had a, a great deal of trouble uh, putting this thing out. But the point is that we are not dealing, first of all, with an incompetent nuclear program. The second thing, and it's very, very critical, the second thing that is mentioned in those transcripts is... When the German scientists are listening to the BBC, the BBC, of course, reports on August 6, 1945, that the Americans had dropped an atomic bomb on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. Yes. And immediately what happens in the transcripts, if you read them, is the German scientists all sit around and decide they're going to figure out how the Allies did it. And the discussion immediately turns to the normal logical thing. Well, how did they enrich enough uranium to build an atomic bomb when we couldn't do it, all right? Yeah. Now, this is an important point because I have argued repeatedly in the uh, beginning in Rack of the Black Sun that the German atomic bomb project was actually three projects. 
and that the Nazis very deliberately kept the well-known big-name scientists out of involvement of that project precisely for security reasons because had those scientists been kidnapped by the Allies or alternatively assassinated by the Allies and in fact both the British and Americans were contemplating secret operations of that nature. So in other words, the Nazis took the, the logical step to keep these big name scientists more or less out of the loop of what was really going on. That, in my opinion, is what was happening. So these scientists didn't even know what was going on in their own country within the SS to develop an atomic bomb. So anyway, they sit around and they decide to figure out how the Allies did it. Well, the first fellow that speaks up is, of course, Werner Heisenberg. And he says, well, you know, we could have done it if we had had 10,000 men, too, you know, and, and been able to have all the, the labor and money that the Americans had, all right? So the first point I want to point out is that the, is that the Nazis had gazillions of of bodies for labor in the slave labor camps, you know, in the concentration camps. Yeah. So in other words, they weren't short of labor at all, and this, again, is what I argue in Reich of the Black Sun, that much of this took place uh, in the concentration camps, specifically at Auschwitz, because the labor was expendable, and it was a perfect way to keep secret research secret, all right? So at this point, when Heisenberg mentions this, Another German scientist by the name of Fritz Wirtz pipes up, and he says, oh, well, you don't really need that, because you, what you do is you take isotope and then irradiate it at a certain wavelength. And then, George Ann, all of a sudden, all of the other scientists start talking all at once as if to drown him out. Oh. Okay? Yeah. And then when the conversation calms down again, it resumes... And a fellow by the name of Paul Hartek responds to Heisenberg and he says, Oh, well, you don't need 10,000 men for that. You only need 10. <laughs> only okay? 10. Only 10. And then he says, I was amazed at what I saw at IG. Oh. And then there's a little footnote. And the editor of uh, and translator of these transcripts says I.G. Farben and that's all he says he doesn't comment on what Wirtz had said about irradiating, irradiating isotope with a wavelength yeah. nor does he comment any further on Hartek's amazing statement that the Germans apparently had some sort of isotope enrichment technology that did not require the tens of thousands of laborers that the Americans were using at Oak Ridge with thermal diffusion gates and uh, cyclotrons and what have you but only required 10, <laughs> okay? And then he goes on specifically to mention I.G. Farben as possessing this technology, oh, all right? Sure. <laughs> so no one knows what's going on here, all right? Yeah. And in the Philosopher's Stone, in the last section of that book, I tell you what's going on, <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Because it is, in a way, a purely alchemical technology that is being suggested here. Because, again, you have the idea of wavelengths of light. You have something to do with IG Farben. You've got some technology that's so advanced, so far in advance of anything the, the British or Americans are thinking of in terms of enrichment technology, that it doesn't require the tens of thousands of laborers to run. <laughs> okay. Oh, my. <laughs> oh, my. And you know what it is? What? It's laser isotope enrichment. <laughs> and let me explain why I think this is what they were talking about. To, uh, to enrich isotope with laser beams requires, first of all, that you possess something called a tunable gas laser. All right? yes. uh, that was one of your questions yes. that you read to me before, the, before we yes. started talking on, on the recording. Well, what this means is, if you think of a standard laser, most people think of a laser as having this little cylindrical crystal in it with uh, two mirrors on each end, only, only one of which is partially silvered that allows the lights bounce back and forth and then emerge through that partially silvered mirror as a laser beam, right? Yeah. Well, instead of 
taking a crystal, you make the lasing cavity a gas, all right, of a particular chemical compound, all right, and you excite the gas so that it will start to kick loose a lot of photons, electrons, and so forth. The light will back, bounce back around between two mirrors, one fully silvered and one partially silvered, just as in a solid-state laser. Mm -hmm. But the difference is, depending on the gas that you put into that lasing cavity, the light will emerge at a different frequency, all right? Okay. Now, this is very important because, first of all, what's I.G. Farben's specialty? Gas. <laughs> all right? The second thing is, is every nuclear isotope has a particular very narrow band of the electromagnetic spectrum that it is resonant to, all right? So in other words, if you have turned a bunch of uranium into a gas, well, within that cloud of uranium gas, you're going to have atoms and molecules of U-235, and then you're going to have atoms and molecules of a lot of other stuff, U-233, U-238, so on and so forth. But what you want are those atoms and molecules of U-235, okay? So what you do is you polarize the gas electrically, and then you beam the very exact frequency that U-235 is resonant to through that gas. And what that will do is it will collect all of that very, very pure U-235 on electrical plates. Oh, my. And then you separate it chemically because any isotope of uranium is chemi will respond chemically to chemical processes the same as any other isotope. So that part of separating it is not that hard once you get it on the electrical plates. You just got to get it on those plates first. So in other words, what the farm hall transcripts are telling you is, if you read them carefully, that these Nazi scientists are talking about a second generation isotope enrichment technology that doesn't become publicly known until about 1979. Oh my. That's why those transcripts were classified for so long. Because that little exchange between those scientists is an indicator that the Nazi atom bomb prog program was not incompetent by any stretch of the imagination. Now, here's the final nails in the coffin, George Ann. I believe that technology had been used at IG Farben's so-called synthetic rubber plant at Auschwitz concentration camp. It was an enormous plant that was built by IG Farben right around, oh, I would say late 1939 and in early 1940. It was huge. It cost 250 million Reichsmarks to build. In today's dollars, that would be about $2 billion. This is an enormous, enormous facility, all right? Okay. Now, here's the problem. <laughs> Number one, it, and I think I've talked about this a way long time ago, very briefly in our, our Cosmic War series. Number one, this plant consumed more electricity than, than the entire city of Berlin. <laughs> okay. Oh, my gosh. Yes, oh, my gosh, that's right. Because, you know, at that time in history, Berlin is the eighth largest city in the world. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's yes. an enormous city. So... In other words, the point is the electrical consumption is way off the chart for anything that you would need for making synthetic rubber, okay? Mm -hmm. Number two, when the IG Farben executives were put in the dock at Nuremberg because they had been using slave labor at this plant in the tens of thousands, okay? Yeah. They testified that during the entire four years of operation of this enormous synthetic rubber plant, guess what? Not one ounce of synthetic rubber was ever made. <laughs> so in other words, they're telling you that the world's most technologically sophisticated chemical cartel in the world yeah. was overseeing a plant for four years that was a complete and total disaster, oh. which, of course, is nonsense. Yeah. All right. Now, the final nail in the coffin that we know is that this, this facility in Auschwitz that Farben built was subject to numerous breakdowns, all right? 
Yeah. And to me, that's the clue that one of the technologies that they're using there to separate and enrich uranium is precisely laser isotope enrichment. Because what are you going to have to do if you have already in 1941, 42, somewhere in there, a tunable gas dynamic laser technology? Well, you're going to have to test that technology on various isotopes and learn the resonant frequencies by brute force trial and error. Okay. And that would explain why the technology kept breaking down. But I think it's clear from the Farm Hall statements that by the end of the war, they had something going there at IG Farben that only required 10 technicians. And in fact, laser isotope technology, uh, enrichment technology, is a technology that is not labor intensive. You just, you know, turn on the button and power up the laser and shoot it through a bunch of, of gasified isotope and you've got your separator. <laughs> you know, it doesn't, doesn't require anything more than turning a few dials and throwing a few switches, you know. Oh my gosh. So it's, it's a very, in a certain sense, it's a very simple technology. The Byte Show is listener supported at thebyteshow.com.